welcome to The Hidden World of Women, a podcast brought to you by Women's Health and Wellbeing Services. My name is Emma and I'll be your host for today's episode. This is the third episode in our Anzac Day series. Today I'm joined by another amazing woman. I'm joined by Tonya Bailey. Tonya is a wife and a mother. She's an innovation consultant. An innovation consultant, does that not sound like the best job ever? Tonya was an arm in the Army Reserve and she now uses the signal skills that she learned in the Army Reserve for good. So Tonya is a DFES volunteer, which is Department of Fire and Emergency Services, and Tonya works in the Incident Control Vehicle. Um, Tonya's son is also, he has just joined the Navy. So thank you so much for joining me today, Tonya. Not a problem at all. So before we get, well, I guess to get started, can you tell me about your experience in the Army Reserve? So what was that like? When did you start? How did you, how did you get there? So I originally was actually applying to go to RMC Duntroon to be an officer. Okay. And, and for I those of us who have no idea what that means, what does that mean? Royal, Mil- Royal Military College Duntroon is where they, in uh, the ACT, it's where they do their officer training um, and it's an 18 month course and then they go out as a, as a lieutenant and lead the peoples. Ah, so what, so what made you want to do that? I always wanted to join the military in one form or another and had been overly exposed to the army, I guess. So I just thought that that would be the thing that I would have to do. That was the thing that I wanted to do. What does overly exposed to the army mean? My dad worked for Department of Defence mm-hmm. and we moved around quite a bit and we, I guess I lived the life of an army rep moving from bases and stuff and the <laughs> We moved around a lot and there was always the military people around. And then we spent, I probably spent my formative years living in Woomera in South Australia, Mm -hmm. which is at the time was a military town full of American people and not many Australian people. And so that's, I think the military was just something that I'd always been exposed to. What was that like for you being, so you use the term military brat, so I'm going <laughs> to, I can say it now because you said it first. What was that like for you moving around to different towns and having to uproot your life regularly? I didn't have an issue with it. I'm a very shy retiring person, as you can tell. <laughs> but um, I know that like my younger, my next sister down from me, she struggled quite a bit with it, with the moving um, because she's quite an introvert. And so it wasn't such a good experience for her. And my youngest sister, uh, mum and dad kind of stopped moving by the time she was 13 or 14, probably about Mm. 13. So it didn't really affect her as much. She got her high school years kind of with the same peer group. Yeah. So I guess because you are more outgoing, did you find that you were able to move into different towns and just slip into that? Or how? what was that process like? Yeah, pretty much I made my way. I just made my way into things, made myself known. <laughs> <laughs> so you obviously had a positive experience of that lifestyle. I did, yeah. But I know that it can be quite, not quite as good because I've seen my sister who who did struggle mm-hmm. in relation to it. But, yeah, for me it was it was okay. But I'm that type of person. I'm happy to go somewhere new and meet new people and make them be my friend. That's who I am. <laughs> And that, I mean, there really are two types of people. So, um, you know, I, my poor kids, so I'm at one end of the spectrum and my husband's at the other end of the spectrum. And I'm the person who will be out in the car park going, no, I can't go in. I can't do it. You know, I want I can't. And he will, he just blazes through the door and he's like, I am here. <laughs> that type of See, thing. I think I'm your husband. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and my husband is probably you because he, We'll literally go into a room and people will go, oh, did Paul come? And I'm like, yeah, he was there. He was here the whole time. Yeah, that is definitely (laughs) us. So, you know, I kind of listen to that and think, oh, God, that sounds like some sort of living hell. (laughs) But, um, but yeah, for my husband, he'd be like, no, it's cool. Look at all the opportunities to meet new people and create new connections. Yeah. Um, So you, your intention was to go to military college and that didn't happen the way you expected? So when I originally enlisted, like I passed all the testings and I did all the, passed all the, the site testing. So I went through what they call a selection panel. So I did all of that. And the very last hurdle to get over was the, so I passed the site testing, but you had to have a psych evaluation. Mm-hmm. And the psych who evaluated me told me I had to go away and mature a little bit because um. I was only barely 17. And I remember sitting on the train from Sydney because we 
had to go up on the train to Sydney from Canberra. And I remember coming back on the train being quite put out that this person told me I needed to grow up, um, which is probably <laughs> With the clearly life, I needed life to grow up. experience of a 17 year old. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like having like a, a full on like you know, internal tantrum and I'm like, yeah. And in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, probably did need to grow up a little bit. Yeah. And their, their suggestion for me were, had been to go and join an army reserve unit in Canberra and see if it was what I really wanted to do. And I think it was also partly to help me grow up a little bit. Mm. Um, so I went and joined what was called then eight SIG rear div. And then I think we became main div and I was with them for the next 10 years. Wow. So it really was something you wanted to do. It was. So what was your experience like in the Army Reserve? And I guess why didn't you go back to to the military college? So I did reapply to RMC quite some years later, but I think part of the thing was that one of the reasons I didn't go back is that I actually started dating a guy who was at Australian Defence Force Academy at ADFA and it was... I let him influence my decision as to whether I was going to reapply. And so, um, you know, because you're young and you're keen and yeah, you're in love, allegedly. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I, when I did eventually apply, um, they have a cutoff of 22 to take oh. you into Duntroon. And I was 22 in June and the, and the intake was July. So I had to get special permission to apply that year. And I did. And then I was on the wait list and then I didn't get called up. Ah. Oh. So I'd passed, like, so I'd actually passed and I'd even passed the psych analysis and I was mature enough, but I didn't actually get in that year. And so then it was too late. Too late, yeah. Um, so the experience in the Army Reserves, I don't, I don't really understand how Army Reserves work. There used to be a really cool ad that was two weeks a year, no, what is it? One weekend a month, two weeks a year, do something for yourself, join the Army Reserve. Yes, I That's remember the ad. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a nice jingle there with yeah. it, but I'm not going to give that to you. Um, that's what the Army Reserve was. So I had my daytime job mm -hmm. and I had the Army Reserve and we would parade on a Thursday night and we would you know, do training. We would do you know, equipment checks. We would do stuff like that. And then one weekend... A month we'd all go out on exercise so we'd go out on a friday afternoon and we'd come back on a sunday afternoon and we'd you know set up you know a brigade like a brigade like area so sometimes we'd we'd go on exercise with the other units that were in canberra and we'd do like a whole set up a whole headquarter thing and then we would do the two weeks once a year sometimes we did them twice a year mm -hmm. and they were like full-on exercises with you know somebody would play the enemy and we'd have all that sort of stuff happening and I participated in Kangaroo 89, which ages me very nicely. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so that, and that was a big exercise. So I actually did um, a month at the, the headquarters that they had set up there near Springvale Station in Catherine, near Catherine, so, as, a, as a comm center operator. Ah, and how many women did you have in the Army Reserve with you? Our Army Reserve unit, because we were signals, mm -hmm. It was, you were more likely to find more females. Yeah. We probably had probably like a 30, 70 ratio. There were quite like, as females go, there's quite a lot of females. Like, um, females especially in the 30 constant. or the 70? We were the 30 still, okay. probably. It depended on which branch. So I was a commsan operator, then there were the radio operators, and then there were the lineys. There were, I think in my time serving, we had like one girl who went and who joined line troop mm -hmm. um they were an interesting bunch um <laughs> <laughs> said with love and affection and yeah <laughs> yeah come saying we had the most number of females mm -hmm. um because it was a typing job mm. people typed we did have some boys but we had mostly females and then radio ops were probably 50 50 but some of us are cross trained like i did the radio ops and i also did the come send. And some of the radio guys did come send, but apparently that was the cooler job. Than... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they wanted the street cred, right? Yeah, but they weren't going to get their food if I didn't type it out. So I always like to point that out to them. <laughs> That's it. I just want you to know that I have the, I'm have i in the position of power here. So <laughs> That's it. If I don't type that log message that says you want your dinner, you ain't getting it. Yeah. <laughs> 
We just need to remember this pecking order. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so when you think about your time in the Army Reserve, what's one of your most fond memories? Probably all of it. It's like it's there's not one thing. It was just the whole experience. The mateship has made me a little bit cheery. Oh. Um, I think the funniest thing, I can give you the funniest thing. Yeah. But, yeah, no, that was, it's, so when I was on Kangaroo 89, we were, I was working a shift in the comm and and uh, it was, like, middle of the night, and a flare went up, which meant the enemy were penetrating, and so we've all run outside and we've jumped into our pits to with our rifles ready to defend. And these APCs, so an armoured personnel character, carrier, <laughs> not character, um, <laughs> they... The APCs come rumbling through and um, then they sort of like divide up to protect the area. And I'm watching this APC come barreling past me and they go quite fast for a large hunk of steel mm. on tracks. And then he just like does this sharp turn and he runs straight through the middle of my hoochie and destroyed my hoochie in my bed. <gasps> oh! And I'm like, that, that was my house. The APC just ran through my house. <laughs> so, so I remember that, like I'd only been up there for like, I don't know, two or three days. I'm like, oh well, I won't put my house back there because apparently that's where the APC goes through. Oh, what did you do? <laughs> I just went and, well, I they I had to sleep in the back of the comms in that night and then they just got me a new stretcher and we sent my hoochie up somewhere else away from the APCs. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Like, oh. <laughs> I didn't have much gear, so it was okay. It was mostly just my sleeping bag and my stretcher and my hoochie that got destroyed. <laughs> so you were sleeping on the floor till you could get another stretcher. <laughs> Oh, they had a spare stretcher out the back, thankfully. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I mean, it's probably not the worst thing that happens to spend a night sleeping on the floor when you're young and fit, but still. <laughs> no, that's it. Yeah, that wasn't, it wasn't her, a horrendous thought process then. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, no, like I did lots of things. Like I, um, oh, in 1988, yeah, 1988, bicentennial, I had a big military thing that toured all the major cities, and I was involved in that. When it came to the ACT, we had what was called a soldier's race. Mm-hmm. And it was an optical course or a competence course, depending on what you'd like to call it. <laughs> and I was with a team of, were there four of us? Were there six of us? I think there's four of us. We were teams of four. And so we had to, you know, run over, under, climb over walls, do all this sort of stuff. So we'd done all this training for this soldier's race. And it was pretty much a, a, a two-minute thing. So they had a big display down at the showgrounds. And I can't remember. I think we were against the university from New South Wales Regiment, they were grunts. So they were like soldier soldiers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't SIGs. Um, mm-hmm. And um, they whooped us. But it was it was awesome fun. And it was about developing those friendships and those those four people that are, or us four people who did that. We, you know, became quite close friends and it was months of training, but it was so much fun in front of this huge crowd to run through with all the pyrotechnics going off and simulated fire and, it's like this is the closest I'm probably ever going to get to war. Yay. <laughs> so I get but it was to good do fun. all this, but also the safety that it's just at the showgrounds. <laughs> it's at the showgrounds. It's at the showgrounds, and they're firing blanks, and it's okay. Yeah. But yeah, so lots of everything. Everything was my favourite thing. I loved the kinship. I loved the camaraderie. I loved the friendships that I've maintained, and just I don't know. It didn't have to help me grow up. Mm, so. I bet. <laughs> yeah. Help me grow up. But no, it was just everything about it was awesome. But I think, like I said, it was one of those things that I think I'd always wanted to do. But I did like the idea that I could still do it, still defend my country, still be on 365 days warning that I may have to go to war if I had to. But I could also have a nine to five job as well. Yeah. I'm wondering, what were you like, what were your thoughts or feelings about the fact that you could actually be called up if Australia went to war? It was what I'd signed up for. Mm. I knew when I signed the piece of paper with my parents' permission because they had to sign as well because I was under 18. When I signed the piece of paper, I knew that's what I was signing up for. I knew that if something happened, I would have to go to war. Mm. My parents are obviously Vietnam vets age group. Mm. My father didn't. um, He was the only son of a farmer and even though he tried to go, they wouldn't let him go and there was lots of other different things. And I think he always felt like he'd missed out mm. and he hadn't been able to do his bit. So my, my grandparents and my, my, his parents were both in the RAF mm-hmm. 
and my grandfather on the other side were in the RAF and then my dad didn't serve and then I've served. So we have a fairly long, like each generation, there's at least one of us who joins the military. And I think my dad had wanted to do that as well. But I'd grown up with the stories from his friends who did, mum and dad's friends who did serve. Yeah. And not all of those stories were pleasant. And I knew that there were issues that could come from going to war and stuff like that. I used to always do the cataflop party at um, Worden RSL every Remembrance Day. And then we'd get to have lunch with the, the diggers and so you'd be talking to people who'd served in world war one and world war two mm. again that shows how old i am <laughs> um and as well as korea vietnam and all that sort of stuff and you they would be quite open in their stories to you so i had no rose-colored glasses of what war would actually be like if i had to go mm-hmm. but for me it was this is what i signed up for this is for my country terribly patriotic of me um but this is at what 17. i want to do yeah <laughs> At 17, 18, yeah. But this is what I want to do. Yeah. And how did your parents react when you told them that you were going to, um, you know, initially they signed the papers, so they were supportive? I think my mum thought it was a bit of a malarkey and she didn't think I would, she didn't think I'd stick to it or something. I don't know why because everything else I'd ever said in my life I was going to do, I did. But I don't think the reality of that really hit her. My dad was just super excited. So my dad's an only child and he has three daughters. So anyone who does anything slightly male-like and he gets super excited. <laughs> yeah. So I remember coming home from my enlistment day and he'd written he'd written Private Bailey, but that it was actually Sig Bailey, but we didn't correct him. He wrote like, you know, I had little notes written on my door and on my bed and on my toothbrush, you know, Private Bailey's toothbrush, Private oh. Bailey's bedroom door. And he was so, so very excited that I had done this. And so he was always supportive Yeah, the whole way through. My mum was pretty supportive once she realised that I was actually going to stick at it. <laughs> and I think my mum was pretty supportive once she realised it improved my behaviours. <laughs> Sweet winning. <laughs> um, and so, but I think for my, my parents, there was no, there was not ever really a threat Like I was a peacetime serving member, Mm. basically. The 10 years that I served, not much happened. Mm. And there wasn't that threat that they'd had during the 60s and the 70s of Vietnam. You know, there wasn't that rumbling of something. It was very much, you know, like I said to you before I got my participation medal, thanks for coming for 10 (laughs) years, have a medal. But it's, I think it may have been different if, it looked like we were going to send people to Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan in my time, but that didn't happen. Mm. So for them, it was just, this was just something that Tonya did. Yeah. Did your children grow up hearing, so in the same way that you went to RSLs and you heard the stories from the diggers and did your children grow up hearing about your time and were they born while you were in um, the army reserves? No, I resigned a month before Harrison, who is my eldest, before he was born. So I was a non-serving member when they were children, but they did grow up hearing lots of stories. They knew that that's what that had been a part of my life. You know, they'd seen photos, they'd had stories, they'd met some of my friends that I'd served with and stuff like that. Always been, I've been a huge supporter of Anzac Day and Remembrance Day and all that, all those sort of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is instilled in my kids so I was a scout leader from uh, for like nearly like just over 15 years with one of our groups up here Mm -hmm. and as part of that we used to we do an Anzac Day vigil yeah at Greymount they they call it Black Boy Hill because that's its name yeah (laughs) um and it's where the 10th Light Horse camped before they shipped out yeah and so we do the the vigil there so we go in on on Anzac Eve do a sunset service that's run by the RSL and then the scouts, so Cub Scout, well, Joey's Cub Scouts, Venturers, Rovers and Leaders hold a vigil overnight. So we have candles on the cenotaph and we have guards, uh, like a, a cenotaph guard that comes in every half hour. Yeah. And then in the morning we do this the dawn service and then we have a gun barrel breakfast and we all go home. My kids have been doing that since they were, Cub Scouts, we've been a big part of that for 15 years. Yeah. And that's something that they've always had instilled in them. I have also invited the RSL guys to come and talk to the Cubs and then to the Venturers 
I missed being a scout leader because I didn't like that age group. So I did the little tiny cubs <laughs> and then I did the big, big venturers who were much more committed. The scouts just were Once they've got through the awkward age, I'll come back. And that, that obnoxious <laughs> 11 to 14 year old boy stage, girl stage. No, nah. <laughs> didn't want to do that. I did the little people and then I did the big people. <laughs> Give me them at the fun ages. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And so I've always had the, like, we've got the local RSL guys will come along and talk and stuff like that. And so it's something for my guys, it's always been a big thing. We've always gone to a service like that first ANZAC two years ago when we couldn't do yeah. the dawn service. Mm. I've, I haven't not done some sort of ANZAC day service since I was 17 years old. Yeah. You know, pro- probably even earlier than that because I was doing them with my mum and dad. Mm. And so it was, it was, that was quite surreal. I was quite, I was actually quite upset about that. I think the dawn services. The, sorry, the driveway services, they had their own form of beauty, you know. So they did, and my whole street was awesome. Like we've got a little Facebook group thing, and so we'd all gone and said we're going to do it. So we're not a very big street. We're a little tiny cul-de-sac, but we were all out, and it was awesome to see that. Yeah, I photographed that event. Was that you know, 2020? I've lost track of dates and times. Yeah, 2020. <laughs> But similarly, you know, we, you know, have our community Facebook group and I put out and said, look, is, is anybody going to be playing the last post? And like, it was very moving to see these children out there in the dark playing the last post lit up by their candles that were in milk bottles. And yeah, it was, so it was, it had its own beauty, but at the same time, it just wasn't Anzac Day. You know, it wasn't it, it? It wasn't, but I think for me, it was awesome to see that we would we still wanted something for Anzac Day, even if we couldn't do Anzac Day. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, one of the kids, some of the kids that were at the time my venturers on their street, she actually played the trumpet. So on their street, she actually played the last post. So they had the driveway service, and she played the last post, but. We didn't have anyone in my street who was capable of that. So we just listened to it on the radio. Yeah. Which, you know, still works. And WA is a big place, so I'm not sure what the weather was like for you, but um, it was raining here. <laughs> so Yeah, it was raining. It was raining at our house. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so there's all these people who are outside and there was one man at the top of the hill who was in his dress uniform with his little – and it, it was quite – I don't want to say cute, but it was quite cute because he was in his dress uniform with his little transistor radio, you know, that was like one of the old ones with the two speakers on the front that you have to turn the knobs on the yeah. top. And I was like, wow, they do still have those. <laughs> yeah, so he was out fully dressed, but then the people across the road from him, their whole family was out in dressing gowns, flannel, slippers, under plastic Bunnings umbrellas type of thing. So it was just... And I think maybe we saw more people participating because you didn't have to get dressed and you didn't have to drive to the city or you didn't have to drive somewhere and then worry about parking yeah. and that kind of thing. So, yeah, definite positives and definitely an eclectic mix. It was very much an eclectic mix, yeah. yes. Yeah, but people still did it in the rain. So They did. And then last year, again, when we couldn't do it, we our whole street did yeah. the service again out the front. Yeah, same, same with our kind of... Well, our street and then a few of the surrounding streets as well. And, yeah, it was quite nice. So there we had a trumpet, a clarinet, a violin and maybe a saxophone, but all sort of a couple of streets apart. But you could just hear the last post being played by all of those different instruments sort of floating over over the little hill that we're on. So quite lovely. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. With your sons growing up, hearing about hearing about your time and your experience – were you expecting them to join an armed service? I wasn't expecting it. I would have been very pleased if one of them did. Mm-hmm. The one that did is not the one I thought that would. Ah. <laughs> well, when they were younger, he's not the one that I thought that would. But the more I think about it, the more I'm like, no, he was pretty much always going to do that. I should have realised. But, yeah, I always thought it would be my eldest child. Mm-hmm. But it's not. It's actually my youngest son. So, yeah. Ah. So why did you think that? Why did you think your eldest would? Because he's very much like his mother. Oh. He's he is his mother in a male younger form. Very gregarious, always up for a challenge, always does something different, always trying something different. Whereas, and I just assumed, I made an assumption. 
option. <laughs> I just assumed that he would be the one because he's the one that is the most like me in character. Yeah. In that respect. But it was actually my youngest son, Tristan, who joined, and he is much more routine orientated and stuff like that. Mm. And so I probably should have seen that this was going to be what he wanted to, that he would be the one that would join. Mm. But I just didn't say it just because he is more reserved, not that much more reserved, but he's slightly more reserved <laughs> than his brother. Neither of my children are reserved. They have a lot of their mother in them. <laughs> so how old was Tristan when he decided to, to join? So he was about 15 when he came to me and he said, Mom, I'm going to join the military. He didn't know what he was going to do. He said, I'm going to join the military. I'm going to become an officer. I'm going to go to ADFA. I'm going to get my degree and then I'm going to go out and, and do my thing. And I went, that's really awesome, buddy. I was super excited. 15. He's still a baby. <laughs> Both my children have decided from when they were about three that they would be engineers. Okay. They I'm were quite 40 set. and I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm 52 and I'm still trying to work it out. Yeah. Um, and so we're nearly 52 and I'm still have no idea what I want to be when I grow up. But yeah, so they both decided very early on that they were going to be engineers. That's yeah. what they wanted to be. They were quite set on that. Like even like all through primary school and high school, everything they did was about graduating to be able to go to university and be an engineer. That's all they wanted to do. Oh, wow. I've never seen two people quite so focused yeah. on what they want to do. They've done they've done very different types of engineering. So Harrison's a civil structural engineer. Mm -hmm. um, he's now working for PTA as an engineer, and Tristan is studying to be an electrical engineer. So still engineering, but very, very different, different yeah. types of engineering. I think it's the maths and the science because mm. that's they're very maths and science place yeah. in the world. I imagine there's yeah, some so he was rivalry 15. between them for, for, you know, oh, this this kind of engineering is better than that engineering and that kind oh, of thing. Oh, they always, yeah, <laughs> they're always, yeah. always making fun of each other. But, yeah, so he was 15 when he came and said to me he wanted to join the military and I'm like, yep, that's cool, that's awesome. I was really super excited. Didn't at the time think I knew what that meant. I knew that that meant that my son would go away. Mm. I knew that that meant he would be a serving member, but I didn't. So how long ago was he 15? And they're going to make me do math. <laughs> Nearly six years ago it was. And it turns out that I can't remember how long ago 2020 was, so that's not going to be helpful for me. But six years ago Australia was still We were in still in Afghanistan. In, yeah. yeah. Yes, we were. Yeah. So we were still in Afghanistan. And it wasn't – I knew what it meant. Mm. I've been there. I've done that. I've served. I know that that means that you might have to go and put your life on the line, but I don't think the reality of what that meant for my child had actually kicked in mm. and it didn't kick in for some time. So, you know, well, we it, went it was through, only 15. He was still going to high was school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, was only, he was only in year 10 at school with eggs at the time. Yeah. Um, and he might change and his then, mind. <laughs> so then we went through, um, you know, he went through in Year 11, end of year 11, he started the process with DRDB, with the Defence Force Recruiting, DFRDB. Mm -hmm. And I must say that's a very different process to when I did it because you just sort of rocked up to a, a room and some dude in a uniform made you sign some paperwork and then at some point someone sent you a letter <laughs> by the snail mail and you went along for a panel and like now it's they do all these pre-courses and they do all this stuff with them. So he's doing all the PT, you know, being able to pass the PT, the the fitness test and they do all these other like day seminars and everything so pre-recruitment process is actually quite good these days I think for what they was there any pre-recruitment process for you like was there anything that kind of no okay <laughs> no. <laughs> they just said sign on this piece of paper Tanya and at some point you'll get a letter that will tell you when you have to go to Sydney and I went okay no no um I mean was there any pre-recruitment process as a parent to say your child is looking into this, here's what no. this might mean or here's where there might be support? No. No. Okay. There was nothing. Still is nothing, but social media has made that a lot different. So I know there's an a, a ad for page that's run by a mum whose son is maybe still at ADFA or maybe he's actually graduated now. I'm not 100% mm. sure. And it's open to all of the parents and it's it was – even though he'd already done a year by the time he got to Adford, it was actually quite helpful mm. 
to speak. And now I've become one of those those people who, when the you know day five and the and the parents whose children have gone and they haven't heard from them and they're all distressed, I'm now one of those parents going, you know what, this actually gets better. Yeah. Overall, there isn't there isn't anything. The only thing we participated in around his recruitment process and around his all of that thing was that we rocked up on the day that he was appointed. Oh. And watched his appointment ceremony. Yeah. For people who are not military yeah. or not ex-military or not never been exposed to military, it would be probably quite daunting. Mm. I had an idea, still wasn't a full idea, but I had mostly an idea. And I have other friends whose kids are also going through the same process and they're ex-military as well. And they're, they're the same as me. Like, yep, we know what to do. But we still have that moment that actually kicks you in the side of the head and you're like, whoa, my kid's actually going to do this. Yeah. So he went through that whole process and then I think it was that it was Easter. It was Easter three years ago oh. that he went off and did his final panel. So it's a selection panel and they sit and they have to do team things with mm-hmm. other people. So he went for a, uh, like three days, I think, to the ACT and they have to do team things and then they have to do, they sit, they have a panel interview, all that sort of stuff. And he was recommended. And so that recommendation then sits in place until they actually get their final year 12 results. Ah. And then they, so some people are offered early places. He wasn't offered an early place. So we didn't know that he was going until the 6th of January. Oh, wow. Of 2020. Yeah. And when did he actually go? 24th of January. <laughs> he flew out. No, 23rd of January. Sorry. 23rd of January. He flew so out. Two weeks notice. And I spent a week of that. I am a national scorer for softball. And so I was actually away in Sydney scoring for oh. our under-14s team for the first week. Oh, God. So I literally had a week with him before he left. Oh, that's heartbreaking. And it must have been really difficult for him thinking, you know, that weight of am I going to go, am I not going to go, and well, for your whole family really, what's this going to mean? When am I going to find out? And then to know that he was either going to be devastated or he was going to be getting on a plane. I'd had many conversations with him about that because he had been quite set on this is what he was going to do and he'd been set on this for some years. Mm. And when he didn't get an early offer, I said to him, I said, okay, bud, what are you going to do if you don't get an offer? Yeah. And he said, that's okay, mum. If I don't get an offer, he said, because he'd still applied to go to Curtin, you need to do it again. Yeah. He said, I'll just go to Curtin. He said, and then I can apply again and he said there's there's like three different ways you can do it so they can pay for your degree that you do in your home state or he could have got the degree and then applied Mm. and gone straight in as an officer so there were many different ways that he could do it and he knew what all those ways were and he was fine he would do one of those ways and he would eventually get in and that's how he was going to do it so when he got the offer with his stupidly high (laughs) ATAR yeah it he basically the, the ATAR stuff came out and then the guy at DFRDB that he'd been dealing with said, we'll get, he said, go to wait for whatever state stuff to come out. He said, and then you should get an offer. And he was right. Like that, that day they rang him and said, you've got an offer. We're sending you the stuff. You'll be gone on this date. Oh. But before that, like when he said he was going to join the military, I'm like, yep, yeah, that's cool. He came to me when, when he started the, so he'd done all the process and, and started doing some chats and stuff with the guys at DFRDB. And he came home one day and he was looking a bit bit shifty. And I said, what's wrong, buddy? And he's like, oh, he said, uh, I've decided which force I'm going to join. And I said, oh, okay. So I'm assuming and you were expecting him to join army because that's that's what you had done? and that's I think of- I was. I was expecting it, but he, I knew also that he didn't have to. Yeah. But if there was the expectation that I was army, he'd be army. But you know what? My grandparents were ref and I went army. So it's one of those things. But he said, um, he looked at me and he's like, because he was, looked like he was going to run away. And he goes, I decided to join the Navy really quickly. <laughs> and he said, oh, they've got much better engineering opportunities. I said, that's awesome, buddy. I said, I don't care which force you're yeah. joining. I just love that you're joining the forces. I said, I, that's what's important to me, not where you are. I said, and you know what? I'll still love you if you're a pusser. <laughs> I'll love you despite of your choices. <laughs> That's it. I still love you if you're a pastor. <laughs> I 
time because yeah, since learned all of the uh nicknames for army so he does call me those as well yeah i was gonna say there is that kind of rivalry between the there is. defense forces and i'm assuming that it's good natured i'm gonna go it is with good it good nature it is <laughs> there is yeah. no real hate though no. they do act like there is but there's no real hate between us because at the end of the day we're all in the same boat yeah well, he's literally in a boat, but he's literally in the same boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so he said he was going to do that. And then it was just the ball rolled from there and it went very quickly. Mm. You know, you kind of had this lead up and would he be offered a position and, but he got this plan and then you had, you know, less than 20 days type of thing between finding out that he'd got the offer, you were away. How did you process it? How did you process the fact that this was actually real and it was happening? You I was really actually really it. super excited yeah. and I wasn't that stressed because there are many opportunities for me to interact with him and see him. So so originally he didn't go straight to what the Navy do is you don't go straight to ADV, you actually go to NEOC, which is the new entry officer course, and that's at HMAS Creswell. So we knew that was only for six months. We knew he'd be home at Easter anyway. We knew that he, we would be going to his graduation in June. So we'd already had all that stuff in plan in place, um, like within, <laughs> within that week that he left. So, you know, we'd booked tickets, we'd booked accommodation, we'd organised all that sort of stuff. We had, we knew he was coming home at Easter. We were quite excited about that. And I wasn't that concerned because I knew I was going to see him. Mm. I knew that he, that was for six months and then six months they go and do some work experience somewhere. And I figured, you know, there was a possibility that he could be sent over here to um, HMA Sterling. So we thought, yep, that's cool. It's not not a forever thing. We're mm. not going to put you on a plane and never see you again. And then COVID hit mm. and we put him on a plane and we never saw him again <laughs> till December. <laughs> and December the 13th, I saw him again. Yeah. Um, you know, so we had 2020, obviously the world sort of went a little bit pear-shaped, which is probably the understatement of the century. So, but it was probably, oh, it was like March... 15th type of thing where we started closing down here in WA and Easter I think that was around April wasn't it that year yeah so he was he was to come home that Easter and they had already booked them flights so we thought he was coming home and then um, only a few weeks a few weeks and out then from that year. about I think it was about a week out from Easter they basically said no nah, they're not coming home they're not going anywhere how did you deal with and that I was I was pissed off for a period of time but then my pragmatic brain kicked in and went do you know what you gave your son to the navy this is what this shit's about excuse me my friend Mm. this is what this is about I know that what I want forever now with him doesn't count because the navy get it first oh let's dig into that how does that go because you didn't it give your son you to yeah, you didn't um, give your son to the navy. He gave himself to the navy. You didn't get choice in that. I did. Well, I didn't. I didn't get a choice because it's what he wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, you get to choose to be happy for him and yeah. you know, and to celebrate and to but, support. But yeah, that concept of you give your son to the navy. Wow, that's what I did. I gave my son to the navy. He joined the navy. That's how it goes. You don't get that. As a mum, you can whinge and complain as much as you want, but you don't get that choice to make it any different. No. It's all right. It's not. And, and I guess the difficulty is that for, for me, I'm used to being in control, you know, and so, and I'm sensing that you're quite used to being in control and yes. to have to let go of that control that's really confronting. Like it, it can be really challenging. It's super challenging, especially when you're, it's your child. Yeah. So my, my boys and I like, you know, their dad and I aren't together for a long time. It's just been the boys and I, and everything I have ever done has been for my kids. Mm. They may cry. Um, <laughs> I'm really sorry. My intention was not to make you cry, <laughs> but no emotions are wrong. That's it. True story. Don't let anyone know I cried. <laughs> um, but he, you know, this is what he's done is basically 
what I wanted him to do. I wanted him to go out and have an awesome life. Yeah. He's going out and he's having an awesome life. He's having an awesome adventure. Yeah. But I, and as an adult, he's now an adult, he's only mm. 21. I don't have control over that. Yeah. And you're never going to have control over it. I just have less say in what happens because the Navy get to say it first. Yeah. So I have more of a say in my elder son who's nearly, who's just turned 24 <laughs> though he'll still do what he wants to do anyway <laughs> but I can express my opinion on it yeah whether he takes that on board or not it's entirely up to him normally he doesn't but but that's his choice with, not yeah whereas you're that's it but with Tristan, Tristan I don't have that choice at all no and it doesn't and matter so, if he yeah. agrees with you he still has to do what the navy say correct oh. and there are there are times when he doesn't actually agree with the way things are going and yeah. so he'll that's where I think being ex-service does help because he'll ring and he'll vent loudly at his mother with much hand flapping. <laughs> and I'm like, but buddy, this is what the service is like. You join the services. This is what the military is like. Whereas I think that for him, that's an advantage. Whereas if I was a non-serving member or hadn't had any exposure, I think sometimes that causes more problems than not when your kid rings up going, oh my God, they've made us do this same thing and then they made us undo it and then we had to do it again, which yeah. is what the military do. Yeah, And he's... So I'm like, dude, that's just that service. This was a great coats on, great coats off. That's how this works. Yeah. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, no. I'm like, oh, no, you know. So I think in that respect, I can bring him back down. But yeah, so I, you know, I gave my son to the Navy. I do accept that I gave my son to the Navy. Some days it annoys me. And, but most of the days I'm super proud that I gave my son to the Navy. And, you know, and when I, you know, I spoke to you before this, that that's what comes through. It comes through that you are, proud and excited and you know really it's all the positive emotions about the fact that he gets to have this awesome adventure and it is it's a, it is like my time as a reservist was an awesome adventure I did things that I would never have done yeah. as a 17 year old ever in my life and he's doing exactly the same thing and you just these are life experiences that and life long friendships and and stuff that you're building that you just it's really hard to do anywhere mm. else yeah so he didn't come home for easter that year didn't come home we didn't see his graduation i still have credit with Qantas. Oh. um <laughs> <laughs> i don't credit. think you're alone in that actually. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't come home until december the 13th of that year did they live stream um, his graduation or anything not that so they the did same, but they yeah. So 2020, I don't think anyone was super prepared No, for live streaming and doing things online. We're much better at it now mm. than we were in 2020. So they did video it, but they didn't live stream it. They had said that they were going to live stream it. So there was like, you know, 100, 100 or so parents all sitting online going, why are they not live streaming? And they're like, oh, no, we actually don't know how to do that. And we're oh. doing it. I'm like, okay, fine. And so they videoed it. They've so got some got, of the got most high-tech tech people in the world and they couldn't work out how to live stream, how to use Zoom. <laughs> so we, we ended up with, I ended up with a couple of photos from the sunset service, which was the night before, a couple of photos before they went on to pray and a couple of photos after pray that he and his mates had taken. And that was pretty much my involvement with his graduation, which was, that was a bit upsetting. Yeah. And not only for me, like I said, we're, I mean, chat groups, they, there were lots of other Navy mums who were a bit upset by that as well. I and think then as parents, when we, we want to finally. I think as parents, we want to be there to celebrate our children's this achievements. Milestone. It's, That's it's it. a milestone. It's a, it's a huge awesome milestone. milestone. And, yeah. and they have to work really hard to get to that graduation ceremony. And you didn't get to be there to cheer him no. on. No. That, but, you yeah. know, no, nobody did. So, you know, everyone was in the same boat, yeah. but still. They did eventually, they, they did video it and then they released the video the next day or the, a week later or something to the cadets. And Tristan sent me the link and he goes, don't bother looking for me. It only shows such and such a squadron. And he said, obviously the videographer knew someone in there because no other squadrons been in it. He said, so literally it was the, it was literally a particular squadrons or divisions oh. um, graduation and like the other four divs didn't count. And so it was just, it was the worst. So not only did I not get to see it and then they said they were going to video it, but there was no point looking at the video because I was never going to find my child in it. Oh. So that was a bit upsetting. 
Mm. But um, but then he went off to Cuttable for six months. But my family all live over east. So the advantage to that was that once he was out of, once he'd finished New York, graduated New York, went to Cuttable, he had weekends free. So he actually spent a lot of time up at my mum's and at my sister's with all my nieces and nephews. So that was good. So he had family. Yeah. He just didn't have You just us. didn't have him. Yep. And we didn't have him. Yeah. But then he came home on the on the on the thirteenth of December and he actually he'd been at my mum's for a week and he said, My flight he contacted me that morning, said my flight's been changed. He said I'm coming in an hour later and I'm like, That's okay, buddy, I don't care. As long as you're coming in. But his flight hadn't been changed, my eldest and he had actually organized. So he gave me like legit flight numbers and with COVID and everything, lots of stuff had been yeah. changed. So I made the assumption that this was, I didn't even question it, which is very unlike me because I'm super cynical. <laughs> and so I'm just like, yep, whatever, buddy. And so Harrison went off to do something. And I said, you have to be back by this time because we have to go to the airport and we're getting your brother and blah, blah, blah. And he actually went to the airport and fetched him and brought him home. Oh, now I'm going to cry. <laughs> was that, so, was that he better got home or worse like, for you? Because, you know, beautiful surprise, but you didn't get to be at the airport. <laughs> they didn't want me at the airport because mum does her thing. <laughs> oh, so it wasn't that he was trying to do a beautiful surprise. <laughs> <laughs> it's just more that mum does her thing. She'll just get teary. No, they were doing it to surprise me. It was yeah. like because we are a big of a prankster family and it was all very funny. So they thought they were awesome. So Harrison actually videoed it, um, him picking his brother up and how they were pranking their mum. <laughs> so Harrison, and the worst thing is like they got home like, minutes later or something and I was getting really antsy I was really cranky and so we're gonna be late to pick up your brother now (laughs) well Tristan's come through the door first Uh, but I've not registered which child it is and so he's come through the door I'm like where the hell have you been (laughs) and he goes I've been in Canberra and I've been here I'm like oh my god and so yeah so it was quite funny, actually. Yeah. And then mum got to do her thing and cry and hug. And, <laughs> and then mum got to do her thing and it was all right because it was in the lounge room and no one saw me and I wasn't at the airport being awkward. Yeah. Um, and then... I think so we should embrace the awkward, just saying. You know, there's nothing hey? wrong with being... We should embrace the awkward. There's nothing wrong with being the crying, teary mum at the airport. Just putting we that should. out there. <laughs> but then, yeah, so then he... Um, he was only here for four weeks and then he went back to what they call yoft at ADFA, which is year one familiarization training, which for the Navy guys can sometimes be a bit like sucking eggs because they've already done NEOC. Yeah. So they've already done six months. So they've done their, I can't remember what they call. They had four weeks at NEOC where you're not, you don't contact them. So when they first go, you don't contact them. You can't contact them for like four weeks. Yeah. You don't hear from them. Like it's just a mystery. You put them on a plane and then one day they ring you. And Yoft is very similar, though this time they, they I think they'd learnt from the previous year with, because obviously none of the cadets had gone home and there'd been issues with kids coping with that yeah. and their resilience and stuff. So they had a lot more access to their mobile phone. So they might, like, at least once a week you'd get, and he would be given, like, they'd go, right, you've got 10 minutes. So he would want to ring us and then he would want to ring his dad as well. Yeah. And so we learned fairly quickly that when he rang, I would just say, hey, buddy, how are you? And I would have like this huge dump of everything that had happened. And I wouldn't ask any questions. I would just take it all in. And then he'd go, okay, I've got to go. I've got to ring dad or I've got to ring somebody else. And I'm like, yep, okay. Um, and so we got that for a period of time. I did actually, I changed my ringtone. Um, this is the advice on the that Facebook group I was telling you about. Mm. Because they, you didn't know when they were going to ring morning, yeah. noon, or night. It was unknown, and I was, you know, you don't want to miss that call. Yeah. And I am not the world's most agile person, <laughs> and so invariably my phone would be at the other end of the house, and it would ring, and I'd be bolting through the house trying to get to my phone in case it was Tristan. Yeah. It was just a and, telemarketer trying to t- sell you roller shutters, <laughs> yeah, something, or something like that. Then one of the one of the second or third year mums goes what I did during yoft is I changed the ringtone for my child so that I knew if I had to race through the house to answer the phone yeah. and I'm like oh that seems so obvious <laughs> now you <So>, said it <laughs> now you said it that actually makes sense so Tristan's ringtone still to this day is in the navy by the oh, because cool. again dating myself <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> so when my phone rings and it's that ringtone, I know I have to run across the house and yeah. answer it. So he went in and he did yoff, but I was able to go in February of last year for what they call the CDF, the Chief Defence Forces Parade. Normally what they do is there's a big parade and everyone comes and everyone watches and then you get a tour of their room and yeah. they show you where the mess is and all that stuff. We couldn't do that because of COVID. We couldn't actually even be at the parade, but I could be in Canberra. So I flew home. I say home because that's where my mum lives. Yeah. So I flew home to Canberra, but they live streamed it and it was very well done. And they had cameras walking through the, you got to see every single cadet. So I saw my son. Nice. Yeah, they learned. <laughs> so, we, so yeah, so we saw him and it was, it was an awesome parade. Yeah. It was very well um, videoed and you got to see the kids and that was, you know, all the parents were happy with that. But then they got leave from like, I think one o'clock that, and then they didn't have to be back until the Sunday night. He was actually two friends of his who he did scouts with. One of them was a third year and one of them was a first year like him and their family were over here and had been unable to go over. So we collected them as little orphans. Uh I went and picked them all up and because they all had to go to office work and get school book, like stuff for uni and all that sort of stuff. So we went and did all of that and then they, Everyone came back to mum's and then we all went out to dinner. And so we did all of that. So I got to spend that weekend. So it was only I that went, like the the rest of the family didn't go. Yeah. And then we thought, cool, we're almost back to normal. So then he came home that Easter last year and that was awesome. And then all the COVID stuff changed again. And then we didn't see him again until 6th of December. That's a long time. But then he was home until... He was on leave until towards the end of January and then he did single service training down at Sterling. So he was still here for another four weeks. Yeah. So he didn't go home till mid-February oh, and okay. he's actually home again now. Yeah. And you've got him for how long? Goes on Monday. So not long enough. It's never long enough. No, it's never long enough. <laughs> and, I mean, it's never long enough, but it must be additionally challenging because in two years you've, you would have seen him for such a small amount of time. And it is. And I think part of my it's okay, go join the Navy and go and do this was that I knew I'd see him. Yeah. You know, we would see him in the uni breaks. We would be able to go to Canberra and see him. There was a lot of we would see you. Mm. So I wasn't distressed about that. Yeah. And then we put him on a plane and then COVID decided to add spicy cough to our (laughs) vernacular. And I pretty much haven't seen him since. And, you know, the 17-year-old or the 18, he was just 18 when he went. So the 18-year-old that I put on the plane is not the nearly 21-year-old that I have now. No. And I've missed, missed that, but I haven't missed it as much as maybe you might have in like 20 years ago. We mm. do um, every Wednesday, he and I video call. Yeah. So that fits in best with his schedule. <laughs> um. And you'll make it work. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll make it work. Yeah. So every Wednesday he video calls me and we chat about whatever's happening and, you know, and he knows that if he's having a particularly rubbish day, he can give his mum a call. Yeah. He's got a couple of really good mates who can't keep in contact with me about him as well. Yeah. Part of that is, because I'll just wind it back a bit, June last year I was very unwell and I nearly died. Oh, <laughs> through through lack of communication, I was in ICU and I'd had a minor surgery. It went pear shaped, and mm. I ended up with necrotizing fasciitis oh, and Jesus. pretty much nearly died. Mm. Um, was in ICU for five days and then was in hospital for another three weeks. All Tristan knew was we have a family Facebook chat. Yeah, and he, my husband said, "Take him mum to the hospital. She's not feeling well." Then everything snowballed, and obviously he was talking to Paul was talking to Harrison. But he pretty much, that's all he was doing. He was spending most of his time at the hospital trying to wake up you know, and be with me. Yeah. And then there was an assumption. <laughs> We're great with assumptions in our family. <laughs> there was an assumption that Harrison had told Tristan. But Harrison was in the middle of his uni exams. So he wasn't talking to anyone anyway. No, Harrison was self-absorbed because he was in the middle of uni <laughs> yeah. exams. So, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. apparently in my drug adult state, I kept saying, Tristan hasn't called. Tristan hasn't called. And I kept saying that I hadn't heard from Tristan because Harrison had been in to see me yeah. and Paul had been in to see me. But And I kept saying, Tristan hasn't called. Has someone told Tristan? And we're like, yeah. And they're like, yeah, yeah we told Tristan. Not realising. So Harrison's telling me Paul's told him and Paul's tell, telling me that Harrison's told him, not realising that neither, neither of them told him. Told him. So I had gone in on the Monday the 8th on that 
following Saturday was actually my birthday. So he rang me for my birthday and he's like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm in hospital, buddy. And he goes, oh, why are you in hospital? I'm like, oh, I feel that there's been a miscommunication and you may have been <laughs> with no communication. <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean? I'm like, I've been really sick, buddy. I nearly died. And he's like, what? And just then the nurses walked in and said, hi, we need to do your obs. And I'm like, oh, I'll give you a call back, bud. And I hung up on him. Oh, God. So I left him with this. <laughs> Thankfully, he has really awesome mates. So he went into his mate's room and he's knocked on his mate's room and he's gone, apparently my mum nearly died and I'm still here and I don't know what to do. And so then I rang back and his friend actually answered and he's like, he's like, because he calls me mum Tony. He's like, mum Tony, what's happened? And I'm like, oh, so this is what's happened. I said, but and in the end, it was probably a good thing because Tristan was also studying for exams. Yeah. They would have brought him home. Mm but there was nothing that he could do. Yeah. He would have probably wanted to come home, but there's Mm. still nothing that he could do. And he was probably better off staying where he was. And then he was thinking, I think there was an opportunity that they may have come home in that July break. And then I think we changed the rules again. (laughs) And so he didn't come home and I'm like, you know what? I'm not doing anything. I'm literally sitting in a chair attached to a vac dressing machine. So, you know, it doesn't, you just ring your mother. So he did ring me quite often in that period. And those are the, I guess, the additional challenges that, I mean, the joys of COVID, they've just caused so much more, I guess, disconnect because, yeah. yeah, you can't just jump on a plane. But as you say, we are so much better off than we were 20 or 30 years ago. And, you know, I remember probably 30 years ago going to SciTech and seeing this absolutely massive version of being able to video call people and thinking, oh, wow, that'll never happen in our lifetime. Like, how amazing would that be? And here we sit on Zoom. And literally, often we're sitting on the ability to be able to video call people. But, yeah, we're recording this right now on Zoom. So, um, yeah, whereas 20 years ago you would have been relying perhaps on a payphone and a letter. I remember being on courses when I was in and going with my little handful of 20 cent pieces yeah. down yeah. to the pay phone and lining up with everybody else because yeah. there was only two pay phones and there was, you know, 50 of you on course yeah. waiting for your five minutes. And that's it. People bang you on the door because it's my turn now. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Feeding your 20 cents in and, and, you know, brain jumping at your parents, all the stuff that they needed to know. Yeah. And I don't know how many, well, I do know it was pretty much every course. Day three, for some reason, was always my worst day. That would be the day that I ring my mother and cry at her and tell her I hated it and I wanted her to come and get me. I've got to go. (laughs) And then I'm like, I've run out of 20 cent pieces. See you, mum. And I would hang up. And like, she's gone, oh my God, I have this very distressed child. She worked out after a while. It was a pattern because (laughs) I obviously needed to do that because then I'd go back to my room and then be fine for the rest of the course um that's what mums are for isn't it we just take all of our emotional baggage and put it on them and we're good that's it (laughs) and you know I guess I I am that for Tristan too sometimes Mm. he has a little bit of a a event at his mother and I'm like yep that's the way it is buddy yeah yeah and so now you've got a couple of years of him studying so yeah so we engineering is a four-year course so he's in second year now and he's got another two years at ADFA. Yeah. And then I think he does six months or something at some special Navy engineering school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I may, may, not have, may not have read that far ahead. And then he'll be posted somewhere, possibly, probably to a ship. And though he is talking about applying for subs, so he could be posted to a sh- sub as well. And then we will probably not see him because they're at sea for up to 10 months of the year so yeah. we'll see him when we see him then and I think I'd resigned myself to that would be what the life would be because I would have five years of him training yeah where I would see more of him and yeah. then that hasn't panned out so that has been a bit of a an eye opener mm. for me because I think at this point in time I'm pretty much living the life of a of a navy mum na- of a navy mum now yeah. when I didn't think that I would be well I guess you sort of thought well I've got five years to I've got five years of connection, five years to see him grow. By the time he's likely to do his first deployment, he'll be 23, 24. Yeah. Where, you know, he's, I mean, not that you, I think, you know, if he was living in a WA, you'd be more likely to see him more than just once every 10 months. But still, you know, when he's 23 or 24, that feels a little bit more 
well, plus it's five years away, you know, so you can convince Well, it's kind of like where Harrison is now. So Harrison's 24 now. Yeah. And he's finally talking about moving out of home, and that's cool. I'm yeah. happy for that to happen now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can do that, love. Yeah. I'm awesomely supportive. So I um, feel like I'm ready for you to take a step. <laughs> <laughs> and he is, you know, but, but again, the flip side of that is that when Harrison does move out, He's still in town. Yeah, he can come around for dinner. He can come and use the washing machine till he can afford to buy his own, that kind of thing. Oh, I hadn't factored that in. (laughs) I think I'm buying him a washing machine. Um, But no, but yeah, so, you know, we can have a, we can, you know, Wednesday night's dinner night or something and and we can do things like that. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things. I mean, we did see how, did see Tristan most sad days on a fort, once a fortnight via, video mm. because we now this is my nerd alert we play <laughs> D and so he plays in our campaign so we would use discord and we'd get to see his head yeah and he would play so that was good but again that's a technology thing if we didn't have that technology he wouldn't still be i think he's more a part he's stayed more part of the family because of the technology than he mm. might have if we didn't have that technology and this had all happened and he hadn't been able to come home. So yeah. he'd been out, he's been able to, technology has enabled him to stay connected to the family a lot better mm. than perhaps he would have. I know that he and Harrison and Darian, my stepson, they're always playing something online yeah. together. So he has that ability to stay connected with the family, which I think makes that coming home and interacting with us different than if he had been away for nine months, not talked to us, and he's going to come back and... Try and reconnect. Reconnect and work out where he slots in. Yeah. Because that slotting in thing is always the tricky one Mm. because the pecking order does change. Like I had that even just I moved over here and all my family are over east. Yeah. And I know I didn't go home for like three or four years. And when I went home that first time, I'm the eldest born. I get to make all the decisions. And then I realized that I didn't have that place anymore. Yeah. That my youngest sister had filled that. And I'm like, oh, no, this isn't working like this anymore. Yeah. And yeah. So he doesn't have that much of an issue because he still is, technology is allowed him to be part of the family. And I think that makes a big difference for any family these days with a serving member is that mm. technology makes that difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're right. I think that it is, you're like, when you go away, you're still who you are. What you don't realize is that you're growing and changing, but the family that you're part of, they're growing and changing as well, but you're not growing and changing together. Yeah. And so technology is amazing and I'm so grateful for it. It does mean that we do get to grow and change together despite distance. Yeah. And so we, and we've been able to see those, that growth and that change and that maturity in Tristan mm. over the time via, yeah, you know, messenger or whatever. Which means which, when he came home two years later, you weren't still thinking of him as the only just turned 18 year, oh, 18 yeah. year old. Yeah. Which, you know, probably did happen to a lot of people in the past mm. is they came and you do, you do have that. I, you know, I, I was separated from my family, not because of defense force, but because I chose not to live in the same state. But there was still that disconnect. But I have less of a disconnect now when I go home because I have more connection with my family than I did when I first moved here 26 years ago. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I was just WhatsApp chatting with my relatives who are in the UK before we started this. You know, like it's just whereas in the past you had to write an airmail letter and then, you know, it would be three weeks before you heard back. Whereas now there's six of us on there all just having a little chat together. (laughs) So Yeah. And we, we have more, you know, you see, you can see them more, you interact with them more and it's very different than a letter from the front that they used to get. Yeah. Sort of thing. And it's, it gives you like, you can see that he's changed. You can see that he's now picked up an annoying saying that's going to drive you insane when he comes home. (laughs) Things like that. <laughs> you can also see him and so you can see that your words and your body language and your emotions, they're not marrying. So tell me what's actually going on for you, bud. That type of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and we do have like sometimes I'll ring him and I'll go, how are you? And his standard answer when I say, how are you? He goes, I'm alive. Yeah. Is his standard answer. But how he says that I'm alive will tell me whether he's sad, happy, 
or just alive and yeah. he's had a guffle. Yeah. And that, you know, from that I can then say, so, you know, sometimes it's like, so what's been happening? And other times like, there's something you want to talk to me about. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas you can't get that from a letter. I'm alive no. could mean anything. And then you're sat there going, okay, which version of I'm alive might this be? How am I supposed to respond to this? <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. You know, and it's stupid things like he and I do Wordle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we do Wordle and we do Cross Wordle. And so every morning while he, you know, I mean, obviously we're still doing it, but he's living in the same house at this point in time. But every morning I get up because they're so many hours ahead and I've got how many guesses it took him to get the Wordle or how many guesses it took him to get the Cross Wordle. So then I've got all day to try and do better. Nice. <laughs> Good work. And it's just it's, it's little it's just little things like that that technology have allowed us to connect with. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for me being a navy mum in this day and age is much better than if I had been a navy mum 30 years ago because yeah. I don't believe I would have coped as well as I have even with my understanding of what it was going to be like. Mm. And so if you were talking to somebody whose child was likely to, you know, they're thinking about joining the Defence Force, whether that's, you know, whatever branch of the Defence Force that might be, what advice would you give them? My advice would be to love them, support them, and they're going to have an awesome journey and it is the best thing they could ever do for their life. Just let them do it, but always be there for them. Mm. And I've literally given that advice to at least half a dozen mums. Beautiful. And also change your ringtone so that if they're ringing. Change your ringtone. <laughs> change your ringtone so when they ring, you don't have to reach across the house. That's it. Or, or you know you, know, you, you don't, across the house. You're not trying to get off the toilet and race across the house for someone selling roller shutters. <laughs> I am much more attached to my phone since Tristan went than I ever was. Yeah. So I do tend to take it, you know, I'm going to the kitchen to get some water. I'll take my phone just, just in case. Because that way I don't just have to run. <laughs> Pretty much. I don't like to run, let's yeah, be no. honest. <laughs> me neither, honestly. I, unless someone's chasing me, <laughs> in which case then I think I'll just hide. But <laughs> as, as all my family saying in zombie ap- apocalypse, all they have to do is run faster than me, they'll be fine. That's 100% <laughs> true. Yeah, I'm fine because I can outrun my husband. That's all I need to do. <laughs> Normally I would end these by asking what does Anzac Day mean to you? I think we've probably covered some of that, but is there anything you'd like to add about what Anzac Day means to you? As I always have told my scouts and my adventurers and stuff over the years, because I often get asked this question, why are we doing this, Harthy? That was my scout name. Why are we doing this? And I say, we are doing this so that we can remember and honour the people who have lost their lives or Put their lives on the line so that we can stand here and say why are we doing this hard mm. so that's it we we do it to remember and honor those people that's and beautiful. it's not necessarily it's not like the people who've lost their lives but it's also the current serving members mm. who are going through different things like i recently did the march on for march for mm. soldier on where you raise money for veterans yeah welfare for ptsd and stuff so i've just finished doing that it's not easy what they have to deal with and so we do it to show them that we support them is that a concern for you knowing that you're so you know we're aware of ptsd we're aware that people often the person who leaves the military is very different to the person who joins the military is that something that that you think about for your son i do i think about it every day and i just hope that i can support him enough and be there enough for him for Mm. that and i don't really think there's anything else you can do no, just be aware. Mm. And again, I know we touched on this earlier as well. What are your thoughts on RSLs? That's a funny question. Um, RSLs, I think RSLs are awesome. I think the services that RSLs offer are actually pretty awesome as well. And my understanding is that RSLs are working better now with DVA and other places as well in providing that support for soldiers which is or for service members which is what they were originally for and then it kind of fell off and they just became a place for the play the pokies and the lawn bowls but now I think they've gone back to more being that support initial support step for serving members yeah or, and or ex-serving members you know I I will admit I thought it was I thought it was a place where ex-members and and serving members could come together have a beer and you know feel like they they were surrounded by people who got it Mm. I didn't realize it was much more 
than cheap beer. <laughs> so, um, so it was a surprise for me to learn how many services that the RSLs do actually offer. And But yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess when I started asking the question, it was around that what's the what does it mean to be able to have spaces, I guess safe spaces for for veterans and for current serving members? And it's actually really important because the stuff that you talk about, the stuff that you've seen, your shared experiences, nobody else has ever had those shared experiences. Mm. They don't understand as well. They can understand, but they don't understand, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. And that makes a huge difference. I think for a lot of serving or ex-serving members, it's a safe place where they don't have to check yeah. themselves yeah. before they they do or say or react, which you need to do. Mm. And I you think know, it provides that space, to... yeah, you, where you can actually just let go of the let go of the. Can I say this? Can I do this? And just you know, must feel freedom. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's an advantage that. Maybe um, you know, people like Tristan have, if they've got a parent or parents who are ex-serving, because he doesn't have to check what he says to me at all, but I've listened to him talk to my mum and I've listened to him talk to like my aunt, like my sisters and stuff, like his aunts. And the way he tells the same story to them is very, very different, different to the way he told the story to me yeah. because he yeah. knows he doesn't have to check. He knows I understand where he's coming from when he says it. Mm. And I think that's an advantage for kids like him who have serving mem- or ex-serving members as parents is you don't have to check what you say and you don't have to check your emotions as yeah. much when you're talking to somebody who actually understands. And that's a big thing. And that's you know the whole PTSD thing is if you don't, if you're constantly checking those emotions, constantly second guessing how you say something, whether you can say something or not, it just makes things much worse than they need to be. Whereas if you can just spill your guts, it's much easier. Yeah. There's so many topics that we've covered today and I really appreciate you being so open and speaking so freely and I do apologise for making you cry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I really appreciate that you did cry um, and before we finish up today, is there anything else that you would like to share or anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered? No, I think that's pretty much it. I think as a just maybe a message to all the mums of serving members is they're having an awesome experience, just support them. Yeah. that's And really I think that's a, a message for all mums, just support them. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the same rule. We just have to maybe apply it a little bit more broadly. But thank you so much, Tonya, for all of your time. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for everything that you brought to this episode. I really appreciate you. um, I really appreciate you saying that you would participate today. And thank you for all that you brought. Thank you very much. It's been awesome, even the crying. (laughs) Well, I joined you in the crying, if that makes you feel any better. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of A Hidden World of Women, a podcast brought to you by Women's Health and Wellbeing Services. For more information on the services we offer, head to whws.org.au or Women's Health and Wellbeing Services on YouTube and social media. Looking forward to the next episode where we uncover the hidden world of women.